Following the recent murders of Marianne Nichols and Annie Chapman, panic and fear swept through Whitechapel. A new inspector had been drafted in to take charge of matters on the ground, Frederick Aberline. He was well respected and one aspect of his appointment is thought to be to stabilise the public perception of the police at the time. There were many accusations, suspects and even arrests, the most famous being a man nicknamed Leather Apron. Though he was later arrested, he provided an alibi for the murders and was released by police. Almost three weeks passed before Jack would resurface, giving himself a name which would become infamous the world over for over a hundred years. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Elizabeth Stride was a 45-year-old Swedish woman. She had moved to London in 1866 and by 1888 was living in the lodging houses on Flower and Dean Street in Whitechapel, working as an occasional prostitute. On the night of the 30th of September, Elizabeth Stride was seen several times with men of varying descriptions, though it is the testimony of Israel Schwartz that is the most intriguing. He claims to have seen Elizabeth Stride at 12.45am with a man around 30 years of age, 5 foot 5 tall with fresh complexion, dark hair and a small brown moustache. He was dressed in an overcoat and an old felt black hat with a wide brim. The man had stopped to talk to Stride in the gateway of Duckfield's yard and the two began to quarrel. The man pulled her into the street and threw her to the ground. Schwartz crossed the street thinking he was avoiding a domestic argument and not wanting to become involved. There was a second man lighting his pipe on this side of the street and the attacker called out, apparently to the second man, Lipsky. Schwartz believed he was being followed by the second man so ran away from the scene until the second man did not follow. At 1am, Louis Dimeschutz entered Duckfield's yard on his pony and cart. His pony refused to enter the yard and although he could not see anything as the yard was pitch black, Dimeschutz thought something was perhaps blocking the path. Using his whip, he probed the ground ahead and came into contact with the woman's body. Assuming she was either drunk or asleep, he entered the working man's club at the back of the yard to get help. Upon returning with Isaac Kosbrodsky and Maurice Eagle, the three discovered that she was dead. It was the body of Elizabeth Stride. She was lying on the ground, head against the wall of the yard with her throat cut. Upon arrival of police and doctor, Dr. Blackwell noted that her body was still warm and judged that by the severity of the cut to her throat, she would have bled to death in around one minute. Judging the timings, it is very likely that Israel Schwartz was the only man to have ever seen Jack the Ripper during a murder. It is also very possible that Jack had been in the yard at the very same time as Louis Dimeschutz when he arrived, perhaps cutting his brutal killing short of any further mutilations. The calling out of Lipsky to the second man has caused much debate over whether or not Jack the Ripper was Jewish or had an accomplice in his murders. However, Inspector Aberline himself did not suspect the second man to be an accomplice at all and suggested that the murderer was not calling out to him. However, he was calling out to Schwartz himself, hoping that he would flee. A year previous, a Jewish man named Lipsky had been hung for the murder of a woman and the name Lipsky had become a common insult used towards Jewish people of the time. Indeed, upon questioning, Schwartz could not be sure to whom the man was addressing. It appears, however, that despite these close calls, Jack was not finished for the night. Rather than fear of capture, he was perhaps frustrated that his work had been cut short. At almost the exact same moment that the body of Elizabeth Stride was found in Duckfield's yard, Catherine Eddowes was being released from Bishopsgate Police Station. Catherine Eddowes was a prostitute who had been arrested earlier that night for being drunk and disorderly, but had sobered up enough for the on-duty officer to release her. She left the police station with a simple farewell. Good night, old cock. Catherine Eddowes was 46 years old. She had been, if not married, in a stable relationship and had had three children prior to her arrival in 1881 to the working houses of Flower and Dean Street. She was not known as a prostitute and was seen to be in a relationship with a man named John Kelly. Nor was she an alcoholic, but had been noted to occasionally fall to drink. Apparently the 30th of September 1888 was one such night. At 1.30am, PC Edward Watkins walked through Mitre Square on his beat and noticed nothing of any significance. Upon his return at 1.45am, however, he saw Catherine Eddowes body lying on her back in a pool of blood, with her clothes pulled up over her waist. Catherine Eddowes had had her throat cut, severing her arteries, this being the cause of her death. 
This was, however, not the extent of her injuries. Her intestines had been removed and placed over her right shoulder. A two-foot-long piece had been detached and placed on the left-hand side of her body. Her earlobes had been cut off, her face mutilated, her eyelids, nose and cheeks all stabbed and sliced. Her abdomen had been cut completely open and many of her organs had been stabbed or cut through, including her left kidney, which had been completely removed. All mutilations were said to have been done after her death. If Jack had been frustrated from being disturbed during his first murder, he certainly took it out on the poor woman here. Catherine Eddowes was buried in the City of London Cemetery on 8th of October 1888. Following the night of the double murders, the police saw fit to make public a letter which they had received a few days prior, on the 27th of September. The letter was headed Dear Boss and has become famous in history referred to simply as the Dear Boss letter. It read, Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talked about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fit. I'm down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Gram work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle after the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. Ha ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all the red ink off my hands. Curse it, no luck yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha. The killer now had a name, Jack the Ripper. In the next episode, we'll see how the letter sparked a craze of communication between killer and police, and in several cases, the public hoaxing the police, as Jack concludes his brutal spree in the most grotesque way imaginable. Please like, subscribe, and sleep tight.